you will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, Theatre Royal Plymouth? Oh, uh, hello. I'd like to make a booking, please. Yes. What is it you want to see? The imposter. Right. The man wants to see the imposter, so imposter has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello, Theatre Royal Plymouth? Oh, uh, hello. I'd like to make a booking, please. Yes. What is it you want to see? The imposter. Right. And which day did you want to come? Friday the 25th. Just a moment and I'll check availability on the computer. Oh, sorry, we're fully booked for that performance. Oh, dear. Um, what about the following day, then? The 26th? Yes, that's OK. We've got two performances on that day, one at 3.30 and one at 7. Which would you prefer? Oh, the later one, please. Mm -hmm. How many people? Well, there are four of us. Are there any concessions? Any children? Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, my daughters are 15 and 12. Do they get concessions? Only the 12-year-old, I'm afraid. So that's one child and three adults. Any idea where you'd like to sit? Stalls or circle? Uh... Tickets for the stalls are a bit more expensive. £12 for adults and £8.50 for children. The circle costs £10.50 and £6.50. Do you get a good view from the circle? Oh, yes. And in fact, we've got some seats left at the front, if you'd like those. Right. We'll go for those, then. Right. That's seats A21 to 24, then. They're very good seats. That sounds fine. So, let's see. That comes to £38 altogether for the tickets. How do you want to collect them? Shall I put them in the post? They'd be sent today by first-class mail, and there'd be an additional charge of £1 to cover postage and administration. Or do you want to get them from the box office yourself? Oh, yes. Could you send them, please? No problem. That'll be £39 altogether. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10 on page 2. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Could I just take your card details? What kind of card is it? Visa? Switch? Mastercard. OK. And the number? It's 3290-5876-4401-2899. OK. And the name on the card, please. It's Mr. J. Witten. W-H-I-T-T-O-N. N for never or M for mother? N for never. Thank you. And now I've nearly finished, but I just need your address and postcode. Yes, it's 42 South Street. OK. Is that Plymouth? London. And the postcode? It's SW2... 5GE. That's fine, then. The ticket should be with you tomorrow. Is there anything else I can do for you? Yes. I was wondering if I could get regular information about what's on. Certainly. I can just add your name to our mailing list. Would that be OK? That would be very good. Yes, please. Oh, and there is something else. Sorry. One of our group is hard of hearing, and I've heard that you can supply special headphones. That's right. As long as you tell us in advance, we can always do that. I'll book those for you now, and you can just collect them from the box office before the show. Thanks very much for your help. No problem. Thank you for calling. Thank you. Bye. That is the end of Section 1. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will soon hear an informative talk given by Michelle on how to keep out burglars and keep your home safe. Before you listen, you have a chance to read questions 11 to 16. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 16. Keep them out. There's no fail-proof way to keep out a burglar, but every little bit of deterrence helps. Even if you can't afford a security system, you can take a few minutes to make your home a little safer. Some relatively simple steps will greatly decrease the odds of a break-in which means you can enjoy a bit more peace of mind. And isn't that what home is all about? Think like a burglar. If you were one, how would you get into your home? Evaluate your home from the inside and out, night and day. You might even try a mock break-in, trying window jams and loose locks on your house's perimeter. To keep out a burglar, the first thing to do is to secure the windows. Though windows are relatively easy to break, the loud noise of shattering glass will deter a thief if you're near other houses. Don't leave windows open during the night, whether you're at home or away. That's a common sense precaution, but a surprising number of people forget to do just that. Use a pick-proof locking device for your windows. Make sure the frames are solid. If you're beyond the earshot of your neighbours, they won't hear the glass breaking. Consider installing a plexiglass sheet for the more accessible windows. This will make entry through them more difficult. Your doors should also be secured. If you don't have a peephole, install one in the front door. If you have one, make sure that you and your family are in the habit of using it. Don't open the door to anyone you don't know, especially at night. If the peephole is out of reach of your children, keep a stepladder or stepping box by the door for them to use. If there's any glass within two feet of your front door lock, consider a locking device that would be out of reach if the glass is broken. Now, a few tips on how to protect your valuables. Don't leave your valuables, stereo, computer, jewellery, etc. where they can be seen from the window. If you don't want to hide everything from sight, consider blinds. Make a valuables inventory. Keep a record of your expensive and personally significant items, not just a listing, but a photographic or videotape record if possible. Store this inventory at another location. This is helpful for both the police and the insurance agency to identify the stolen goods. Use an engraving pen to mark these items with some kind of personal identifying information such as your initials, in an inconspicuous place. This also helps record your possessions in case of any other mishap, such as fire or flood. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. Don't stop your security awareness at the outside walls of your house. Your yard areas, if any, also deserve your attention. In general, don't leave anything around the yard that might help a burglar get into your house. Ladders, stackable boxes or any garden tools should be put away. 
preferably in a locked cabinet. Install a light in your yard that is sensitive to movement. Place it high and out of reach. Trim hedges or bushes that are near doors or windows. These can be good hiding places. Don't place outdoor furniture tables nearby the house. These could become an easy stepladder to the roof. When you are on vacation, create the occupancy illusion. Maybe you laughed at your mother for leaving the lights on and the radio playing while she left for vacation, but she had the right idea. Those steps aren't quite enough, so try these strategies: buy electronic timers that turn lights on and off at different times. Hook up a timer to your TV for a few hours each evening. Turn up the volume too. Not enough to annoy the neighbours, just enough that a lurker at the window sill couldn't miss hearing it. Have your newspaper and mail delivery suspended. If you don't have time to do this, ask a neighbour to pick them up for you. Ask a neighbour to park in your driveway or parking place. Think about having someone house sit your home. If it's a relative or friend, it may cost you no more than the contents of your refrigerator. You can also find professional house sitters. Or house sitting services that find someone to stay while you're away. Leave your shades as they are normally, or at least don't close up everyone. One sign of a vacant house is closed shades during the day. Lock your garage door with a padlock. That is the end of section two. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three on page one hundred and twelve. Section three. You will hear two geography students, Jack and Katie, talking about a field trip to Kenya in Africa. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four on page one hundred and twelve. Now listen carefully, and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Katie, hi. Thanks for inviting me round. Oh, thanks for coming. I know you're up to your neck in finals revision, but I've got to make up my mind about next year's geography field trip, and I'd really like your advice. We've got to choose between an African trip and one in Europe. They've told us a bit about both trips in the lecture. But I really can't make up my mind, and I know you did the African one last year. That's right. So where exactly did you go? I mean, I know it was in Kenya, in East Africa. Yes. Well, we were right up in the northwest of the country. It was beautiful. We stayed in a place called the Marich Pass Field Studies Center. Right. Doctor Rowe said the accommodation was traditional African-style cottages.、Uh, he had a special name for them. Bandas. Yes, they're fine. You have to share two or three people together. They're pretty basic, but you have a mosquito net. They don't provide spray though, so remember to take plenty with you. You'll need it. <laughs> And there's no electricity in the field centre. You'll have hurricane lamps instead. They give a good light. It's no problem. What about places to study? Doctor Rowe said there was a library. Yes, but it's quite small. There's a lecture room as well, but most of us worked out in the open air. There are plenty of places outside. And it's so beautiful. You're right in the middle of the forest clearing. I gather it's a relatively unmodernized area. Definitely, they actually set up the centre there because it's on the boundaries of two distinct ecological zones: the mountains, where the people are mainly agriculturalists, and the semi-arid plains lower down, where they're semi-nomadic pastoralists. Before you hear the rest of the conversation. You have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty 
on page 112. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So how much chance did you get to meet the local people there? Did you get the chance to do interviews? Yes, though we had to use local interpreters, but that was okay. Then we did field observation, of course, looking at environmental and cultural conditions, and morphological mapping. What's that? Oh, looking at the surface forms of the landscape, the slope elements and so on. What about specific projects? Yes. After the first two or three days, we spent most of our time on those. We could pretty well do what we wanted, although they all had to relate to issues concerned with development in some way. People did various things. Some were based on social and cultural topics, like the effect of education on the aspirations of young people. And some did more physical process-based studies, looking at things like soil erosion. My group actually looked at issues relating to water, Things like sources such as rivers and wells, and quality and so on. It was a good project to work on, but a bit frustrating. We felt we needed a lot more time, really. Right. Dr. Rowe did say something about limiting project scope. Yes, he told us that too at the beginning, and I can see why now. What else? Well, we had some good trips out as part of the course. We went to a market town, a place called Sigur. That was to study distribution. And to look at agricultural production, we went to the Weiwei Valley. That's an important agricultural region. And what about animals? Did you have a chance to go to a national park? Sure. We did a trip on the last day, on the way back to the airport at Nairobi. But actually, there was lots of wildlife at the field center. Vervet monkeys and baboons and lizards. Mm, it does sound good. It was excellent, I'd say. In terms of logistics, it was very well run. But it was more than that. I mean, it's not the sort of place I'd ever have got to on my own. And it was a real eye-opener. It got me really interested in development issues and the way other people live. I did find it frustrating at the time that we couldn't get as far as we wanted on the project. But actually, I'm going to follow it up in my dissertation. So it's given me some ideas and data for that as well. So you'd say it was worth the extra money? Definitely. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a lecture on a traditional Japanese form of stitching called sashiko. First, you have some time to look at questions. Good morning, everyone. As you know, we're continuing with the part of the textile course where we look at some different types of stitching or stitching techniques. And today, we're looking at one that comes from Japan. It's called sashiko. Now, what does that word mean? Well, it translates as little stitches. And in its modern form, um, you can see from these pictures, it produces a very, a very beautiful decorative design on things like cushions, curtains and quilted covers. All produced by hand, of course, and many sold in shops these days. But sashiko began long ago, and its Japanese origins were much more functional than this. It started among farming communities, in mountain villages in the north of Japan's main island. Centuries ago, 
Transport was difficult in these places, and the bitter climate made it hard to grow fibre plants for spinning and weaving into warm cloth. Also, there were no sheep in Japan at this time, so uh, no wool either. And this meant that people were left with a locally produced material called asa, that was hard wearing, but not very warm. So, what they did was to dye this local fabric blue, because the dye was thought to strengthen the fibres, and they solved the problem of warmth by stitching together many layers of this cloth. In this way. They produced clothes that were warm, but not too bulky. It was done、uh, with a white, heavy thread,、um, so there were many shades of blue cloth, light and dark, and white stitching, and so a typical look or image was created, like this. They used designs based on traditional Japanese patterns that had their own names, such as sea wave, perhaps to reflect the wavy effect of the design. Here's another example. Now, each garment that was made at this time was planned for a specific purpose. So, for example, waistcoats were heavily stitched on the back and shoulders. If they were going to be worn while carrying heavy baskets, and it wasn't only country people who relied on sashiko clothing, in Japanese towns, firemen dressed for duty in sashiko stitched garments, jackets, trousers, hoods, and gloves, which were soaked with water to protect them. So, the point here is that sashiko clothing. Was essential for survival at one time, and even though making things in this way took up many hours for people who also had to work, do household tasks, and so on, it was a vital skill. The wife of someone like a farmer, for instance, had to spend time making clothes, and she would do the stitching without a frame or structural support. And the garments, once you put them on, were flexible, and moulded themselves to the wearer. If you look at a genuine sashiko garment today, then you can see the evidence of wear, and get a feel for the shape of the wearer's body, which is fascinating. Then, in 1895, traditional life changed, and sashiko was no longer necessary. Because rail travel reached northern Japan, and warm textiles could then be imported. However, since the 1970s, sashiko has been revived in Japan and has also been taken up by quilters and embroiderers in the USA and the UK. Nowadays, the designs are a little different. There are vertical and horizontal stripes, for example. Or the stitches can be arranged to produce a diamond effect. Here we are. Similar fabrics to those used traditionally can be found in modern furnishing or dressmaking departments, or from suppliers, so that the traditional appearance of a sashiko item has been maintained. Now, there are exhibitions of ancient sashiko items, but the disappointing thing is this. While old pots and ceramics are considered to be treasures and preserved even with cracks, ancient garments made by poor village women have not been given such a high value, and sadly, many of them have been thrown away, rather than getting the attention of collectors. This is a pity, because they say a great deal about how people once lived. And about their technical skill, and it's no coincidence that sashiko has now become a pastime on an international level.